feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Scribner, your host with my co-host John Werner from Link Ventures today. He's a, an advisor to our amazing guest today. I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. It's really, really cool technology that I'm definitely a geek in that front and I can't wait to actually play with his technology when it's, when it's available. I'd like to remind all our listeners that this show, all our shows are available uh, basically anywhere that you can download your podcast, Google, Stitch, SoundCloud. We're nationally syndicated through iHeart. You can go to the shrimptank.com forward slash Boston. You can also see uh, the, the various cities. We're in 13 cities across the country. Uh, we'd love to get your followership. And um, with that in mind, I have my co-host from Link Ventures today. His name is John Warner. And we have Bernard Hazmat from Braylon. Uh, it's a technology that, um, and actually just was reminded of this because my son was playing with his Oculus Quest this weekend, trying to explain to him uh, this company's technology, and he was excited about it as well. They primarily focus in the space of um, the gaming industry as well as finance. Just as a start off, there's so many different applications I could see, like in the medical, just basically anywhere. And um, real quickly, uh, just it kind of reminds me of that movie, The Minority Report, if anyone's seen that movie where uh, the futuristic way of being able to interact um, in a technology world that um, doesn't have to have a big headset that um, my son wears on the weekends with Oculus Quest. So with that in mind, um, Bernard, it's, it's great to have you here. And um, I wanna you know, have you talk about your technology and some of the exciting things that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much, Mark and John, for having me on this session. I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk to your audience about this upcoming technology. Uh, it's um, it's quite an interesting twist uh, to to you know what the sci-fi perception have been of this place. You know, you always get this heads up displays and these sort of a, a, a headset based, you know, vision of the future where people are looking like cyborgs, you know, uh, a kind of a Mad Max sort of scenario and walking in the streets uh, of, of, of the sort of cyberpunk future. But what we are doing here really is a, is a different version, a different vision for, for, for the future. What we believe will be the future is, is, a, is a frictionless, you know, uh, future for immersion where you don't need to wear any headset. Um, you don't need to change much or disrupt much the, the ecosystem of your work, but everything would just get more comfortable, more ergonomic, and also more immersive and, and higher resolution. So at Brilliant, what we're creating is really the first, uh, um, you know, the first headset-free virtual monitor. So, so what does that mean? And it means that you have a device that sort of gives you immersion. It gives you a virtual, large, uh, virtual panoramic uh, um, uh, image, but it doesn't require you to wear any headset um, or any, you know, contact lenses and such. So that's kind of the vision on the hardware side and on the software side as well. You know, we want to cut the, the friction as much as we can in terms of the content that needs to go through through this medium, we want it to be fully backward compatible. Um, I like to, I mean, we have run this, we had our pilot phase now. So we, uh, you know, we are running this with a lot of gamers and, and finance centers to replace multi-miter setups, for example, that's one of the immediate applications. Um, and, and a lot of feedback that we have got is that it's like you're plugging your laptop to an IMAX theater. Uh, you know, imagine if you were, you know, you had that, that fidelity and feel of, your, of an IMAX theater on your desk in a, in a sort of a small compact space, how would you use that, right? And, and for me, you know, we, we are really getting into a new level of immersion, and I like to call it the age of visual abundance, where you don't care about the size of your screen in, anymore, you don't care about the resolution because it is fully fulfilling your, your, uh, your depth perception and your, your field of view. Yeah, so um, is it true uh, when I was watching one of the demos and um, for our listeners, we're gonna post a link here because the technology and the videos are amazing and, and Zoom unfortunately doesn't lend for that much of a demonstration, but we'll, we'll post a great link for this. But um, so you're able to, in essence, I'm looking, I'm on a Mac, MacBook Pro right now and whatever that is, 20, 15 inches. 
But when you're looking at it, it's almost the equivalence of looking at something like 100 inch plus TV, uh, not the immersion part, which is a whole different experience, but you're almost entering into a completely different world when you're looking at a very small space. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like looking through a window to a, you know, a much, much bigger space out there, right? So, you know, you have this, this effect with the window when you're closer to the window, you see more of the outside space. And, the, you know, you might be able to see a gigantic building through your window, but you still get a sense of that, that you know, huge size and depth and distance from the window. You understand that. And so we are trying to emulate some, some, some sensation that is close to that. And uh, right now, even at our pilot program, for example, the, the image that we pro provide is, is 122 inch diagonal. And, and it is coming from an aperture size that is 32 inch. So basically, physically, the, the display looks like, the size looks like a, you know, a normal 32 inch monitor. But what you see through it is just much bigger than the physical size of, of that aperture. Mm -hmm. um, John, feel free to jump in. I just I'm obviously a geek with this stuff. Um, one of the one of the kind of the negatives with the headset world was uh, user. I don't know if it was dizziness or nausea or how it worked, but it, is that something that you've had to kind of like work around or feedback wise? You you know, is it a, is it a a positive experience when people are using this technology? Yeah, so uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, basically, actually, I was, I, was, uh, um, I was head of optics before this in another company, uh, which was making augmented reality uh, uh, headsets. And, and, you know, I've always been excited about headsets and, you know, displays and of the future and such. So, um, uh, the, the problem with headset, though, is that, you know, uh, there, there's multiple fundamental friction. The first one is content, right? So, so you know, you need to completely reinvent the, the content stream that you want to play in these headsets. The second problem is the ergonomics. You really have to wear something on your face. And that is just not comfortable. Like, even if you, you know, even if you get the headset down to like size of a, you know, uh, small like swimming goggle or something like that, it, it is still not as comfortable as not having to wear anything, right? Um, so that, that's kind of another major uh, problem. And the third problem is that because you're wearing it, you are very weight sensitive, you are very capital intensive in terms of miniaturizing this device. There's a big push on you to make this device more socially acceptable on your face to make it thinner, smaller, more miniaturized. Whereas if you didn't have to wear any headset, suddenly two of the major hurdles just disappear. Like you don't need to miniaturize it as much because it's not on your face. Uh, um, and and it, the, the uncomfort of having to have it on your face also goes away. Then it comes, comes to you know, uh, several other frictions, for example, is it compatible with existing 2D content, right? Or is it comfortable on the eye when I look at it, do I get head, headache or do I get nausea or uh, sensations like that? And so we have done a lot of work at Brilliant to make sure that we give you as natural of an image as possible, where you can use it for eight hours a day, every day without getting headache or, or nausea. So that's, that's one of the big advantage that, advantages that we have. And also, so Ormac, the, yeah. let me just jump in here. So I think the monitor industry is like a close to $30 billion market. And I have a question about some use cases. I do want to say that um, these headsets that we're living through now, Mark, you just referenced your son. I think it's going to be like uh, when they crank the cars back in the, the, the teens or the 20s, uh, people will look back at how we use these headsets and say, you know, that, that was like putting a toaster on your head. And, and people get sick after 15 minutes. And for people to be productive uh, or to enjoy entertainment, that ju just doesn't work. And I'm, I'm really impressed with this product. And I look at how uh, Bezos kind of said, oh, I want what Star Trek has for voice. And that's how Alexa came about. I see what uh, Barmac's doing is kind of reverse engineering the holodeck. And at some point we're gonna have a brain computer interface and there's gonna be all sorts of ethical issues, but that's often the future. And I think this is, 
the hardware that's going to be between now and, and then. But let me ask you about the market. So say it's a multi-billion dollar market, financial centers, like a lot of people have multiple desks. It's almost like a way to show off how important you are, how many monitors you are. What are you doing to that industry? Gamers, you know, I know some computers have water inside them just to cool the, the chips. Um, you know, how does this play with gaming? I think of limited office space. Um, you know, there, there are places that people, you know, the whole work from home movement that this, this device can help with. And another thing occurs to me is, are there industries that could benefit from your product that the business model isn't even there yet? Kind of like Uber and the smartphone, it took someone saying, hey, the smartphone could be used for this. Could your headset or monitor be a way to inspect nuclear power plants because the quality and immersion is, is so good? Are there some industries that you're gonna create as a result of this? So, um, you know, I just want to make sure your hardware is not going to get squashed like a grape and is relevant uh, in these times. That's, that's, uh, these are a lot of uh, great points, uh, John. And, and I, think, I think, you know, like for, for any technology to really succeed, you have to be very practical and you have to, you know, grow through the market and, you know, listen to your customers and sort of grow with them, right? Um, once once something becomes really extremely disruptive, then there is there is always this mismatch between the existing ecosystem and that that higher level of experience. So for us, one of the very obvious sort of values that this device could add was just replacing multi miter setups, right? So if you could have an, an experience that you have with a three miter setup or a six miter setup in form factor of a thirty two inch monitor that would be already a big win, right? That, that would help us to, you know, uh, uh, you know enter, and enter the, the higher end of this market, both on the gaming and on the professional users. Like, as you mentioned, traders, for example, are known to have a lot of, a lot of displays that they have to see the data in. And also there's other game, gamers, like especially higher end gamers, like um, uh, uh, people who do AK gaming or people who, uh, do car sim racing or flight simulation. Those are the areas where you really appreciate this large panoramic experience, and that's where our technology shines the best at this time. But but you know this is not the fine you know the end of the vision for us. Uh, what we want to do is really we want to we want to give you just just like Google they give you like megabit you know megabits of, of uh, you know, storage, cloud storage, we want to give you megapixels, right? And we want to make that in, in, in a serviceable way that, that you, can, you can, you know, forget about how much resolution your screen has or how, how big it is, right? And then once you have that kind of visual abundance, you would be able to define new services and features in this gigantic display, basically, right? So it's, it's, like, it's like giving you a huge piece of land right and telling you okay you have this massive land you don't really need more than this much for doing your daily work and now i'm going to put some coffee shops here next to you you know at the edges of your land and you know you 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 got you you get access to coffee all the time and all those things so that's that's kind of what, what the bigger vision is here as well um I was just curious on maybe just turn uh, turn the page just a little bit. The tagline is where uh, book smarts and street smarts collide. I, I our listeners probably don't know, but you're, you have a PhD in optics and um, obviously very very bright. Um, MIT. I think you have a, a pretty big background there. Or at least you know have some exposure to MIT. You being um, an entrepreneur, the CEO. Um, how critical is it for? in your experience, like being associated with people like John, you know, uh, private equity people and, um, you know, the university setting where a lot of, at least here on the East Coast, a lot of amazing companies have been hatched, but, but how, how critical, in your opinion, um, is it to, you know, launch an endeavor like this, you know, with the exposure to like the, the capital brain trust of, uh, say, MIT? That's that's. I think that's a very good question, Mark. And I can I can talk like for two sessions only on that that matter. And I think it will resonate with a lot of people, uh, because I was I was a research scientist at MIT for four years. My background is in ultra fast imaging and, and photonic devices and nanoplasmonics and those kind of stuff. Um, and and 
what's really difficult is that my background is actually in more sort of a hardcore physics. It's not, it's not so much of like a coding where you can just go and make an app and start to make a marketplace and, you know, really uh, uh, be a little bit more business driven toward that direction. You know, there's a bigger gap between, you know, optics and physics and, you know, business world. So, so to make that arc, you know, it, it was a lot of like, you know, steep learning, you know, uh, uh, curve. Um, and I would say, you know, um, in, in, in the world of physics and, and, and academia, you're, you're really talking to universe. You're, you're trying to understand the universe. Whereas in, in the world of business, you're talking to people and you're trying to understand people, right? And, and uh, understanding uh, behavior of societies and people in a way that they respond to a product or, or they perceive a brand is, is, is as interesting as you know, understanding how universe responds to certain triggers and certain stim stimulations. Um, so, but there is a big gap, okay? So I, I'm, I'm not gonna deny that. What, what I understood in this journey is that the, the world of entrepreneurship and business on the scale of, of, uh, of, of you know, monetary scale, it is much more vast than, than the world of academia. The world of academia is, is much smaller. There is a very tight bubble in each area of expertise. And, and then you can get even finer to those expertise. And you have you know, these celebrities in, in a certain area that are really good in that one narrow thing. Whereas in, in the business and uh, uh, to, to do a startup, you have to become much more broader. You have to, you know, really broaden your vision. And that's why working with people like John, who, who are super connectors, you know, who, who, can, who can basically have this uh, great communication skill with, with a, a massive number of people is really, really helpful. I think if, you, if you're really starting from a very, you know, hardcore ac academic background, I think you need a co-founder or set of people that have been in business world and uh, can talk that language and that, that once you're set up with them, you can, you know, slowly learn how to, how to, um, you know, communicate like that and in that world as well. Yeah, so, so to, to consolidate, to, so, you know, to have someone that can augment your skills and, you know, there's no tenureship in uh, being an entrepreneur, you don't, you don't, uh, Get a free pass. I mean, you either you either make it or you don't. Um, but go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. So, Barmack, I've known you for years. I consider you part Leonardo da Vinci, part Tony Stark. Uh, you have a <laughs> PhD, but you enjoyed drawing graphics and depicting what 50 years would look like and making it accessible to everyday people, not just uh, narrow IEEE, you know, PhDs. Uh, you know, who uh, all use slide rulers to kind of uh, communicate. Um, you are incredibly creative. You've got a bunch of patents. I'm just wondering, is this device, are people gonna like it? Is it gonna become like the new oxygen that people are gonna need to do work? Or is it gonna be a nice to have that someone may buy it just to show off that they have it in their office, but it collects dust and it, it doesn't go anywhere. Like how have you used your creativity to understand how people would use this and be more productive as opposed to a 2D monitor. I mean, you understand the two eyes and how they see things and, and you're giving a, like a whole nother dimension with this product, but there's a, there's a graveyard of products that never made it that are epic fails. Like, like how are you making sure this isn't an epic fail? That's, that's a, you know, that's, that's, a, 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 that's a great, a tough question, but let me, let me tell you about you know, what we have here, you know, it's, and I, and I will, you know, really take the clock forward and take you through the future, like step by step on how this device will be perceived. It's really not about this single device that Brelion is making. It's about this new vision, new discovery that tells everyone in the world that, hey, immersion doesn't have to come with a headset, right? And, and this, no matter if Brilliant, you know, uh, if Brilliant succeeds or fails, this new chapter is going to continue in, in, in the future. So you, you, you're going to end, that's like the next chapter in displays, like there's no way around it. There's no way that you can just keep having larger and larger physical monitors until your desk is like a, like a wall, right? Like that, that's not going to happen. It's not practical. So 
at some point you really have to have virtual displays. So, so no matter, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, a inevitable solution. Like it, it, you cannot escape from it. So this, it, this solution is coming no matter if we win in bringing it to market or not. But now taking you through, through the future, let me tell you how this, this device would feel in the initial years and then how it would evolve. And at least that's, this is what we want to do. So initially this, this device would feel more proper for things like car sim racing, flight simulators, maybe some trading desks, you know, people who have teleoperation centers, that's where you see this device being used rather than being on all the, you know, all the desks around the world. And the reason for that is of course, the manufacturing, the cost, is not just going to be affordable for everyone to buy this device, right? And, and so you only get market fit in the places where your value is really appreciated so much to pay for that price. But as we go forward, Brilliant would like to become the sort of the high-end, high-performing gaming display. So, so you would hear more and more about us in sort of 8K gaming, in high refresh rate gaming, immersive gaming, uh, large format gaming. These are the places where we want to sort of sit as the time goes by. And then after that, you know, if, 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 you know, if everything goes as planned, then it will become more of a prosumer product where, where you go to someone's house and, you know, he's working with a 32 inch monitor and you're like, why don't you just get a really on display? Why don't you just get a virtual, you know, monitor? Like it's way better. It replaces six monitors and it's like, you know, 8K or 10K resolution. It's just, you know, it's just so much better than a 32 inch monitor that it's almost like, you know, a no brainer. Like, why wouldn't you want that? Right? So, so that's kind of the trajectory as, as the time goes by. Hey, uh, Barmac, uh, my, uh, Mark works with a lot of financial types, you know, tracking the markets. Will you be able to see things uh, and communicate things fast and, and maybe do better in investing as a result of using this product? Have you, have you thought about that at all? Yes, we have thought about it. So we are working with some of our financial uh, partners, uh, some of the biggest banks in the world uh, are part of our early access program. And, and we're exploring a lot of these user interfaces in this panoramic mode. We're working with some of the biggest um, uh, trading, trading you know, institutions. They're very famous. I'm not going to name them. They're under NDA. But uh, um, basically, we want to define new user interfaces in this, in this medium such that it enables you to actually get more productive, get more use of that peripheral vision that you get with these displays. Um, it do you, uh, it, and it might be part of the technology now, but I mean, the visual component is, is amazing. I, I encourage everybody to watch the video. It, it's, it's just spectacular. But um, you know, part of uh, part of the technology, at least in the financial services world, there's a lot of you know mouse point and click type of stuff. Do you envision this technology to be able to be um, similar to? Again, I was just observing my son this weekend with Oculus Quest with two, you know, remote gadgets and grabbing and doing all these crazy stuff. But do you uh, do you foresee this the evolution of this technology to be able to you know grab and move around and you know stuff like that? That's that's a Mark. That is a great uh, uh, question, and we have got that from multiple different you know uh, clients as well. Uh, right now, our focus is you know very 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 uh, sharp on display. We want to be able to nail that visual experience, and that user interface you know is is you know a section of industry of its own where we see that you know. You know, progressing as the time goes by, such that you have solutions out there, like from Qualcomm, from maybe from uh, Leap Motion or others, that that you know it will enable you to have that hand gesture communication or, or sort of interface that can be easily added to this display. So for us right now, our focus is just to get that visual experience as comfortable as possible, as immersive as possible, and with the highest fidelity we can, adding those kind of features for the interface layer would be much easier later on through, through partnerships with those entities. That makes sense. So you, you, you know, you're really focusing on what you do well and executing at that level. And um, you know, the other services and partnerships just present themselves as they're available. Correct. John, go ahead, you had, you had a question? 
Yeah. Um, how much is 5G important here? I feel like there's the desktop, the laptop, the mobile, and the next wave of computing is going to be a combination of immersion, like the matrix to uh, Iron Man, where it's digital information on the physical world, and it'll be contextual computing. But for us to get there, I think 5G uh, latency bandwidth is going to be a big factor. You know, how much does uh, does bandwidth help your your product, and 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 how will that uh, make the experience uh, better uh, for the user? That's 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 a very uh, interesting overlap that that we are exploring as well. And and uh, to be honest, the five G actually can open open a lot of doors for new services in this type of medium. the The truth of the matter is that if you ask someone that that works in communication networks or uh, or displays, they're going to tell you, well, I, I don't know. It doesn't look like there's there's much synergy between you know higher resolution displays and 5G because usually the network is connected to your laptop and then your laptop or, or your computer through some graphics card has to run uh, a, a higher resolution displays. But what if you could actually you know shortcut shortcut the the graphics card or or the, the graphics card of your laptop, or, or the, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the HDMI links that it has to provide to the, to the display through the internet. So that's, that's one of the interesting areas that, that we're exploring, where you have a massive amount of pixels. Let's say you're, you're running a 10K uh, display, and this 10K display is, give, is given to you in a 155 degree field of view, for example. So it's really massive, high resolution, high fidelity experience, but your laptop is not doing most of the job to run the entire screen. Your laptop is just maybe running you know, uh, 4K on that screen or putting some signal that is up res through some internal chips or through some edge computing or through 5G. So. It, those are scenarios where 5G can be can be helpful, where it can en enable doing online high resolution, high refresh rate experiences like gaming, for example. 5G is known to be great for gaming, and this basically is at the at the physical layer of that experience that 5G 5G enables. Marmak, um, sorry, you go, Mark. Oh yeah, um, so. You said something before I thought was really interesting. And again, I'm not an expert in this space by any means. It's, it's fascinating stuff. But you know, um, a lot of the, the technology that was out there with the headset, um, uh, you mentioned something about being backwards compatible. And I think a lot of times, like some of the, at least from a leisure perspective, like you have a limited title or games, the cost of you know, writing these things, it's, you know, it's small and um, you know, we play you know, Xbox as a family and stuff like that. But but how critical in your opinion is is um, the back end making that simple so titles and software or financial stuff doesn't have to be completely redesigned to work in this environment. That's that's actually one of the most important bottlenecks that that you know display companies usually face, especially the immersive displays and 3D displays, you know, there are a lot of great companies here in the Valley that are working on light field displays, you know, immersive uh, autoscopic displays, for example, that give you a sense of depth. Uh, some of the issues there is exactly this, this point where, you know, you have this device that can provide immersion, but it's not backward compatible. It, you know, there's no content for it. And, and com converting that content to, um, to this new medium, this new media has always been a challenge, but there is hope at the end of the tunnel here because there is a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms now that can do this conversion from 2D to 3D and, and providing depth and such. What we are doing at Brenion initially is actually 2D. So you can just connect, for example, at our pilot program, you can just connect your laptop and see a massive screen. It's 2D, you don't need any sort of conversion. So we've really solved that, that, that friction at the beginning because for us, it's very important to have a hardware that is sticky enough. You know, you can make a hardware that is extremely, 
you know, advanced in terms of providing depth and, and giving you a very large uh, um, angular range in terms of the rays that are coming to your, to your eyes to give you a very immersive sort of holographic, you know, experience. But what happens to these kind of startups is that they realize that, okay, I have this cool demo in the lab, but there's just nothing out there. It's almost like a vacuum out there. If I put it outside, nobody can use it. There's no content. Now my customers have to pay a lot of money or time to, you know, to, to get some sort of content to run in that, these types of displays. And we are saying that, you know what, let's dial back down on, on, on that depth and, and 3D. Let's first try to understand if, the, if this massive scale on 2D helps people and there's no friction on the content on that side so you can run, you know, uh, one more demos is actually Horizon, uh, Forza, Forza Horizon 4, which is basically just a game. You just can play it in this. You can play any of the existing game in, in our display. In, in, it's, it's like, imagine connecting your PlayStation into IMAX theater, right? And just enjoying playing on that, right? So you can you can do that with our device today. So that's that's very very important. Um, but this doesn't mean that you know we don't want to you know bring more of that depth perception and, and, and you know 3D down the line. It's just it's not a very smart strategy to put all those frictions in front of you right when you want to go to market. Good point, Barmac. How defensible is this? Like, could Samsung or Apple just steal your technology and, and, and create a version of it do you, and, and then do you eventually want to be bought by one of the major um, companies that, that play in hardware or, or, or do you want to get a big market share of the monitor space and, and then uh, pivot into some other things? What's your long-term play? Our long-term play is really bring this new category of experiences to the world where it's just like 10 times better than what you have today, right? You want to make your life much better. Your experience of computers is much better. And we see that that would enable many more business opportunities in that medium, uh, much easier than, than the existing headset-based platforms. So that's kind of our, our long-term vision. But in terms of other companies copying us, look, I mean, we have, you know, we have 10 patents in this, in this domain. In, in the matter of one and one and a half year that we have been we have been uh, alive basically, and and as one of our patents is already granted. Some of them are international. Most of them are U.S. patent pending. So so um, we have tried to create as much IP footprint as we can and as our capital allows. Uh, uh, now, can Samsung and Apple, you know, uh, um, uh, our our friends in these companies, can can they replicate this? Um, look, there is there's multiple components to this technology. Some of them are macroscopic components, which are usually easier to, to replicate, and some of them are microscopic uh, uh, um, uh, uh, components, which are kind of harder to reverse engineer. You have to sort of be have the capabilities to, to reverse engineer. But look, Samsung, you know, uh, replicated uh, smartphones. Xiaomi replicated smartphones. I don't think there's anything in the world that is more integrated and, and hard and, you know, uh, detailed as a smartphone. So, uh, you know, there's always a possibility there, but then you have these legal frictions that you have to go over to if you want to do that, right? I think for them, it, it would be smarter to just work with us rather than, rather than trying to actually. So are, are you like the Rolls Royce? Are you the Ferrari? Are you the Volvo of this space? And, and how big of a market share do you think you can get, or, or do you want to get? That's 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 exactly what, what I, I wanted to touch on. Basically, we are I, 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 internally we like to say we are like the Lamborghini of this place. So so you know initially we're going to be the Lamborghini, right? It's like the the Tesla Roadster kind of stuff, and then then you know we, you know we want to ramp up the production and do you know Model S and then Model Three. So it's kind of the same strategy, and it it, it makes sense that strategy because. Uh, you know, initially when you're really getting to the market, uh, 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 you know, the Samsungs and Apples are like, okay, this market is really small, it's not interesting for me. And so you're making progress there, you know, positioning yourself as, as the Lamborghini is a high price, low volume kind of an experience. And then as you sort of dial, dial up the production, then, you know, then, you know, these bigger entities really have to take you seriously because you're, you're coming to that market. How hard is it to manufacture it now? Like, uh, I mean, are you doing it locally on the West Coast or like, tell me about like, 
how different yeah, so, makes so, so, scale it. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. So actually, um, we are getting different components at different parts of the world, and they're assembling here in California. So um, it is it is not some of the components are not manufacturable in all, you know different all around the world or China, for example. So we had to you know work with some some of the capabilities that other company companies had. Uh, I would say our our you know our device is a is a good mixture of Japan, Taiwan, and U.S. Okay, that's great. Well, um, we're get, you know we've tried to keep sensitive to time. Um, I just again would like to remind all our listeners: you can find us Google, Stitch, Apple, uh, anywhere that you get your podcasts, syndicated through iHeart. Uh, we are now becoming uh, one of the biggest entrepreneurial podcasts in the country. Um, so, for I our got listeners, a last question from Barmak. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, Barmak, you've done terahertz. You've done femto photography. You've done a lot of. Uh, innovative technology you know how fun is it working on this how does this compare and then uh for the listeners and and you know mark has built up a, a great uh, audience how can they help how can they benefit from your uh innovation as an investor or as a technologist uh what, what do they need to know what do you what, what help do you need uh to go to the next level yeah i mean uh, we have a lot of social feeds that you know if if you uh, help us to grow awareness on, on what we are doing. Of course, that will be helpful. You know, uh, our website is brilliant.com and we are we have a page. If you search Brilliant on LinkedIn or Facebook, we are there as well. We have Twitter page as well. So any of those would help to spread the word uh, around. Um, and and uh, that that can be helpful. We are we are we are raising capital as well, so that's you know that's uh, uh, going well. And and I think you know working with some of the top tier investors that have experience in hardware um, or hard tech, that's something that always uh, that's always a pleasure. Um, so that's that's kind of the on the on the help side and on the on the you know. Uh, my background, as, as you said, you know, I, I have, have is, you know, a decent history of working in different ideas in, in physics and optics and a lot of like futuristic visions of the world. And at some point in academia, I was like, I don't want to just publish papers anymore. You know, I, I really want to, I really want to like change, I, I want to bring some of this idea to the world. And, and the only way that I saw that that would be possible was to just actually start a team that we really build these things and put it outside in the world. So that has been really much more rewarding when you when you bring gamers in front of this device and they're like, wow, I didn't know this would be possible. You know, like and, and that moment is really, really rewarding. It's almost like you know, publishing a nature nature paper or whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, satisfies you in academia. Well, give us a promise that you come back when uh, this is widely or universally adopted. We'd love to, to see uh, the progress. Absolutely. And we uh, wish you much success in your endeavor. Um, below your, this video, um, Oliver Knox information links, uh, social feeds will be here. Just click on that, follow him for sure. And um, on behalf of John, I'd like to thank you for your time today. It was great and we wish you tons of success. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, John and hope to see you soon i've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank big fish small pond in the shrimp